don't think we need any other introduction. <laughs> Thank you, Fran. Good morning, church. Welcome to worship at First Christian Church. Uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, we are so glad that you're here. There are welcome cards that you can find in your pew that you can fill out and place in the offering plate as it's passed by so that we can get to know you a little bit better. This morning, we'd like to extend a happy Mother's Day to all of our moms out there, understanding that motherhood can take many forms. We also understand that Mother's Day can be a tough holiday for some folks. Um, so our prayers and our gratefulness go with all of our moms out there. I would like to uh, invite you to enter into worship by hearing these words from the psalmist. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Let us stand and sing together our opening hymn. Before we enter into our time of prayer this morning, we're recognizing the graduates in our church community. Uh, celebrating the milestones is one of the wonderful gifts of sharing life together. And so on this day, we do indeed celebrate the milestone of graduation, 
uh, and we will share our collective blessings with our graduates as they begin to live into whatever it is God has next for them. Uh, so we will invite the following graduates to come up front, and then we will offer a blessing for them. Uh, so Blake Gabbard. Um, Blake will be graduating from Bowling Green High School uh, here in a couple weeks with honors. Uh, Blake is in the Army National Guard and will be going to basic training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri in August to become a combat engineer. And then we'll be starting Murray State University in January of 2023 to study business. Uh, Sophia Koppensteiner is graduating from Greenwood High School. Um, she was elected the youth governor for the 2021 mock government conference and was the beta president. Uh, Sophia will attend Center College as a Lincoln Scholar, which means she was chosen as one of 10 students for a full ride scholarship. Um, Peyton Daly uh, graduated from Western Kentucky University uh, with a degree in communications and public relations with a minor in American Sign Language. Uh, Peyton will be moving back uh, to Cincinnati uh, to see what's next for her. Uh, Megan Munay um, also graduated from Western Kentucky University with a degree in communication studies. Um, she had two minors in creative writing and meeting and convention planning. Uh, she received a couple of awards, including Most Spirited Hilltopper and Most Involved in Delta Zeta. Um, she is moving back to Louisville for a new job as the marketing representative at the Bell, Bell of Louisville Riverboats. Um, ben Morrison graduated from Western Kentucky University with a bachelor's in music and vocal performance. Um, our longtime choir intern will be attending Penn State University on a graduate assistantship to pursue a master's in vocal performance. Uh, Madeline Wilson uh, graduated summa cum laude from Western Kentucky University um, and the Honors College with a Bachelor of Science in Marketing and a minor in Digital Marketing. Uh, she accepted a position as a Junior Digital Marketing Specialist for Inked Brands in Bowling Green to begin later in May. Uh, Jack Eason, uh, graduating with honors in American history from Washington and Lee University, where he double majored in American history and geology with a minor in the classics. Uh, he will be attending law school at the University of Alabama in the fall. And then Dr. Stephen Gadd um, graduated from the Kentucky College of Osteopathic Medicine as a doctor of osteopathic medicine. Um, he will complete his internal medicine residency at Ascension St. Vincent Hospital in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, let's give it up for our graduates. So graduates, today we celebrate you. Um, graduating is a big accomplishment in any season, and this is something each of you have achieved in a time of pandemic in a time of sort of coming out of a pandemic, and in a time of we still don't know and we're still unsure about some things. Um, it's been a season where you have thrived even when it hasn't felt like it. Uh, you have learned new things, you have asked bold questions, you made discoveries about who you are and what you value, uh, you've made memories and friendships that will continue to shape you. So today we say to you, our graduates, congratulations. And we say, wow, we are so grateful to be celebrating you. Uh, we are not just recognizing your graduation. We are recognizing and celebrating your resilience, your creativity, your light, and our collective excitement for the gifts and dreams you will share with the new faces and places you encounter. Uh, so each of you will have a, get a gift here in a second. And in there, there's a daily prayer book. Um, and so we will offer you this blessing, um, and it's an adapted prayer uh, from that book. So let us pray. God of endings, of change, of the future. What we thought would not end has ended, and we find ourselves here wondering where we are and how we got here and where to go from here. Uh, be with us here at the end, at the turn to what's next. Help us place our feet on the ground. Help us to look up and around Help us believe the story of today and to celebrate it. Because you know about ending and you are not afraid. 
help us, help our, our graduates to embrace moments of change, of change for the better, knowing you stay with us in our story and that you have given us all we need for what's next. Uh, may they each go with courage, with openness, with love at their core. That's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now a couple gifts for y'all. Y'all, we have some pretty impressive uh, graduates in our congregation, don't we? Man. Uh, so as we continue in this spirit of prayer, uh, we give thanks to a God that hears our prayers. Um, those we share aloud, those we are holding on to, uh, those that we are still finding our words for. It is such a gift to be in prayer together. And so we will lift up a few specific prayer requests this morning. Uh, for Velma Vaughn, Jason Vaughn's mother, uh, she was in the hospital on a ventilator but is now breathing on her own. Uh, so we do give thanks for improvements and we'll continue to pray with her uh, and Jason and family um, in her recovery. Uh, Lord, hear our prayer. Uh, Linda King is having hip replacement surgery on Monday, uh, so we pray with Linda for a smooth procedure uh, for the strength and the rest um, and recovery to follow. Uh, Lord, hear our prayer. Uh, Kathy Severns is now home, uh, which is good news, uh, but is still not feeling well, um, so we will continue to pray with Kathy uh, for her comfort and for her strength and for her healing. Uh, Lord, hear our prayers. Uh, Ann Fields has been moved to a rehab center, uh, so we continue to pray for her and for her healing. Uh, Lord, hear our prayers. Uh, Buddy Morris tore a ligament in his knee, um, and so we surround Buddy and Mary Jane with prayers for strength uh, and for the resilience he needs to rest and to heal. Uh, Lord, hear our prayers. And then Kim Meyer's brother passed away on Friday. Uh, so we surround Kim and pray with her and her family in this time of grief um, and pray that love surrounds and sustains them in this time. Uh, Lord, hear our prayer. Uh, let us continue in this spirit of prayer together. Good morning, church family. Uh, happy Mother's Day to all the women who hold special places in our hearts. Uh, it's, uh, it's your day today, so enjoy it. Uh, it's good to be together this morning, and as we prepare to pray, let's just try to calm our minds and open our hearts to God's ever-present love. He is here with us this morning, and uh, let's take time to take a deep breath and enjoy his presence. If you would, let's have a moment of silence together. God, of all that is good, we gather this morning for multiple reasons. Many are here to celebrate our friendships in Christ. Others need time to reflect upon their blessings or maybe seek to understand their trials and tribulations. Some need comfort and peace, but no matter our reason for gathering, we are here as a church family and need to feel your presence. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings that you bestow to us. Let us remember you when we watch a child bring your light to the altar, when we see children skipping to worship and wonder, when we enjoy the sight and smell of beautiful flowers, when we find comfort in our furry animal companions, and when we share a good meal with close family friends, you truly are a gracious God. Father, this morning we ask you to walk beside Megan and her family throughout the sabbatical. Allow her to rest while she takes time to rejuvenate herself and her ministry. 
We ask that you stand steadfast beside Kyle and Daniel and Paul and Crystal as they provide leadership while directing church efforts in Megan's absence. Loving God, please watch over those that are graduating. Let their new journey be one of excitement and full of your blessings. Provide them clarity and direction as they pave the paths for their future. Let them feel your presence as they enter this new season of life. Heavenly Father, move us to cheerfully share your love. Give us courage to stand on the side of what is right and just. And let us, through our actions, be the voice of your holy goodness. And perhaps, yes, perhaps most importantly, let us insp or inspire us to take care of one another. And now as a church family, let's pray the prayer that you taught us so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, our children are invited to children worship and wonder.
Amen. Thank you, choir. This morning, we will hear from the Gospel of John, verses 5 through 30. So get comfortable. It's a long one. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flock drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You will worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in the spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. This is the word of the Lord, and in it we can trust. I think it's easy for ministers to read a text or a story like this one and make a lot of assumptions about what their church already knows. It's no secret that Disciples of Christ folks are a mixed bag of Christians. Some of you come from a Baptist upbringing, so your Bible knowledge is deep. It had to be, am I right? Some of you are retired clergy who have studied, preached, and taught on these texts. And some of you didn't grow up in church. So you're hearing these stories for the first time. It is so easy for me to read this story and think, it's all been said and heard before. But that's not true, is it? As we change and grow, God's word stays the same, but its meaning in our lives evolves. That's why the Bible is so amazing and adaptable. There are always something new to learn, and there is always something awe-inspiring for God to reveal. So I want to start today by sharing some tidbits about this story that come from studying the text a little deeper. A refresher for those of you who already know and knew, um, and for those of you who haven't, some new nerdy information um, to take home with you today. Congratulations. 
First, it's noon in our story. The woman goes to draw water at noon. What is significant about noon? It's the hottest part of the day. Maybe she was an introvert. Maybe she needed some time alone. We don't know why she chose to come at noon. We only know that she didn't want to run into anyone, especially not a Jewish man. Second, it's been said that Jesus points out her marital status because she is considered a sinner or immorally compromised. But nowhere in the text does, it, does Jesus allude to this judgment. There are a few different reasons why she has been married five times and now lives with a man who is not her husband. But that isn't our business, and I'm not going to get into those details because Jesus didn't care. Third, Jesus is in Samaria. Samaritans were the enemies of the Jewish people because they had differing opinions about where God should be worshipped. Sound familiar? either on the mountain or in Jerusalem in the temple. And not only was she a Samaritan, but she was a woman. Jewish men or men in general were not seen talking to unknown women alone. Fourth, Jesus offers her living water. This doesn't mean running or flowing water, but a metaphorical water, water of eternal life. He offers an unnamed Samaritan woman, who is a stranger, eternal life. So with these four tidbits in mind, let's see what this story has for us today. Last week, Reverend Lee challenged us to start the bridge building process by laying a strong foundation between ourselves and God. Without this groundwork, all other bridges we build will eventually crumble. How's your relationship with God? Is it right and perfect? You hate that question as much as I do? It's probably not right and perfect. If it's anything like mine, it's complicated, confusing, and amazing, all at the same time. So as we move forward with this series, remember that our relationship with God is an ongoing journey. We pray, we listen, we learn, we grow, repeat. Find comfort in the fact that God wants a relationship with you. For the last two plus years, First Christian Church has been a part of a community development cohort called City Shapers. I know you guys have heard me talk about this before. This group has met together several times in person and over Zoom, thank you pandemic, um, and through assessment of our community and our church, alignment with other organizations and churches, we have discovered that Bowling Green's biggest issue is connectivity. This means that we do not know or trust our neighbors. This means that many of us do not have relationships beyond the surface level of giving a wave or saying hello. This means that we are not working together to make Bowling Green thrive. There is a divide. Building bridges is hard work, church, because opening ourselves up to others is scary and risky. Yet that is exactly what we need to be doing. Like I mentioned earlier, we don't know the woman at the well situation, but for some reason she feels unsure of herself. She's keeping her head down, trying not to draw any unwanted attention. To be a woman in this social context wouldn't grant her much authority or importance. She was viewed as little more than property. But Jesus chose her. Jesus acknowledged her. Jesus spoke to her. 
In this story, we find a great example of how to connect with each other, no matter our background, our situation, or what society views as acceptable. And it starts with hospitality. Jesus asks for water, a physical representation of the promise between supplier and drinker that no harm will be inflicted during their interaction. Jesus was on her turf. Samaria was the land of her people. Giving Jesus water was an expression of trust, even if she questioned his uncommon request. It puts all parties involved at ease. Hospitality equals feeling welcome and comfortable. I feel like that's something we're good at here. Next, we are called to share something about ourselves. Jesus offered her living water, eternal life, the gift of God. He told her who he was. I am, he said, Messiah, the one in whom God is known. Jesus only makes this proclamation a handful of times in the Gospels. So it's very important. And who did he share this good news with? An unnamed female Samaritan. Now I'm not saying that you need to go up to a complete stranger and share your deepest, darkest secrets. That would be strange. So instead, read the room a little and share something that invites this person into your life. Find some common ground. For the next step, I want you to remember that Jesus is Jesus. He knows things. Jesus knew this woman because he already loved her when she was formed in her mother's womb. We are not Jesus. Did y'all hear that? We are not Jesus. We're not going to know things, personal things about our neighbors before they even speak. But what can we do? We can listen. We can practice hospitality, we can share, and we can listen. The woman at the well had questions. She wanted to figure out who Jesus was. She was curious about his offering of living water. She wasn't afraid to challenge his faith and the faith of his people. This is how we get to know people, conversation one-on-one -on -one interaction, understanding without judgment or assumptions. I think this is the most difficult part about building bridges with each other. We love welcoming folks through our doors and into our homes. Hospitality can be surface level. When it comes to sharing, most of us can talk about ourselves all day long. We are more than willing to share about our jobs, family, hobbies. But when it comes to listening on a deeper level, especially to those who are different and see things differently than we do, it can be tricky and uncomfortable. Thursday afternoon, I met with part of my City Shapers cohort at Taquiera Los Vasquez restaurant on Morgantown Road. If you have never been there, it is so good. Our group wants to get to know the local owners in that area so that we can partner with them to get the word out about their businesses. We want to see that area thrive, but we can't do that without relationships. As an introvert, this is terrifying to me. My face sometimes deceives my feelings, I'm sorry. I'm not always comfortable answering questions on the fly. I like to be prepared. Conversations with new people can be very intimidating. Maybe that's why God put these words on my heart for today. We all know that God can be funny like that. So our City Shaper group will walk Old Morgantown Road on June 9th. We will see what businesses are there which lots are vacant, and talk to people who we meet along the way. I'm scared. It's risky, but it's worth it. Because it will lead to the last step 
we observe in Jesus's lesson in forming relationships. When I know you and you know me, despite our differences and our flaws, unconditional love can grow. When I know you and you know me, we can work together to build something great. When Jesus shared that the true worshipers will worship God in spirit, he was saying that God wasn't and isn't tied to a physical location or even a certain group of people. The Messiah doesn't only come to Israel, but also to those whom Israel marginalizes and despises, a God for all. And what does she do with that information? She shares it. She joins in the ministry and tells her whole town the good news. She is given a purpose and she becomes a witness. Now, I don't know what will happen on Old Morgantown Road in the weeks, months, and years to come, but I do know that bridges will be built between neighbors. Hospitality will be extended. We will share a piece of ourselves. Our ears will be open and ready to listen. We will work alongside one another and relationships will grow. Because when I know you and you know me, God can do amazing things. Amen. After two and a half years of not being able to have a Bethany Fellows retreat in person, y'all know what I cherish the most? I looked forward to every single meal that we had together. Not necessarily because of the food. Uh, there was red beans and rice at every meal, including breakfast. The coffee was not all that great, although I will say the salad bar was world class until we ate all of the spring mix. I looked forward I cherished those ordinary moments to sit and eat with friends, longtime friends, new friends, that time to share stories and ideas or talk about absolutely nothing at all. For even in our time of silence, we sat at tables resting in the presence of community. 
almost every single meal in that dining hall, someone from the staff had to come up and tell us that it was time to go because they were trying to close up. We needed that time around tables last week. Tables filled with laughter, with dreams and discernment, with the reminder of the gift it is that we share in this life, in this work, this faith together. We know it is life-giving to be at tables, so we do it a lot. Each week we gather at Christ's table, invited to live into the rhythm, to the wonder of how God can take a loaf of bread and break it, and in sharing it, fills us with life. Or how God can take a cup and pour it out and root us in this unconditional love. Or how a simple table can hold so much and remind us that we are not alone in any of this. So as we gather today, we notice that we are surrounded with folks who share in this with us. We gather meeting Jesus who says whether you're laughing or grieving discerning or dreaming whether we have a lot to say or nothing to say at all other than to just rest in the shelter of each other Jesus says you are invited you are welcome you are loved and so you are invited to taste life to share love and to stay as long as you need to so we remember It was on that night Jesus gathered with his friends and his disciples and he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it. And he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, Jesus took a cup and he blessed it and he poured it out. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Each time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. This is the bread of life, the cup of God's love for you. All are welcome at Christ's table. Let us pray. God of love, we give you thanks for this bread of life, for this cup of your love for us, for a table to which all are welcome. May we meet you here today in the goodness of bread and the sweetness of cup. Uh, May we come to know your love, be sustained by it, and transformed by it. Uh, It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
I want to be sure to take the opportunity to say thank you again for your support uh, in my pr participation in Bethany Fellows. Uh, I know many of you have heard the name Bethany Fellows many times, um, if even just this morning, but returning from a week on retreat feels like a good time to remind people what it is, uh, what we do there, uh, and why it matters. Um, Bethany Fellows is a mentoring and spiritual leadership ministry that supports young clergy, uh, usually in the first five years of their full-time ministry. Uh, so we get to participate in two retreats a year over the course of four years where we have opportunities to be surrounded by other young clergy. Uh, there are wise practice sessions with experienced leaders uh, with various insights to support us in our work. There is a day of silence, which, as you can imagine, is a challenge for me. Uh, there is time for worship, for check-in with small groups, and time to just laugh and rest together. Uh, then our mentors and small groups check in with us throughout the year. And then Bethany Fellows has been expanding continued opportunities for its alumni network. Um, for me, Bethany Fellows is a deep breath. It is a space of friendship and connection with colleagues who just get it. Uh, it is a place of guidance and support. Um, it is a moment to be rooted and sustained in this wild and holy call. Uh, First Christian Church has been a longtime supporter of the Bethany Fellows. Uh, Megan went through it and still meets yearly with other Bethany Fellows alums. Uh, Kyle went through it. Uh, the Reverend Kelly Dick, better known as my sister, went through it. Uh, your monetary gifts supporting that participation along the way. Uh, so last week in Chicago was such an incredible gift. Um, if you couldn't tell in communion, it was life-giving to be in that circle. Uh, so thank you for believing and supporting that ministry um, and also for gifts that are always eager to lift up those ministries that are rooted uh, in life and love. Um, if you are with us in person this morning, you can share your monetary offerings in the, in the plates as they are passed, uh, or if you are online, you can give online using the link uh, by mail or dropping them off at the church in the locked mailbox. Um, we are grateful for your generosity. Um, let us pray. God of love, we give thanks uh, for the gift it is to share life together and for a community of people who generously share uh, their gifts for the work of life and love in this world. Uh, may these gifts shared in this time of offering continue to set spaces for all of your people to gather and be seen, uh, embraced, and loved. Uh, it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before our announcements this morning, I want to share how grateful and thankful I am for our choir. Uh, so let's take a moment to thank them before they go on their summer break. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Going from uh, singing mass to sitting with us and singing with their backs to us and from here and with a choir room that's under construction. There, there's been a lot, so we are so happy that they could still sing for us and share their gifts. Um, a few things before we go. Uh, we're still looking for volunteers to do communion prep. 
It's really simple. All you have to do is fill two trays and cut up some bread on Sunday mornings. Uh, if you have any questions, you can talk to Daniel, and the sign-ups are on the bulletin board. First Christian is hosting a shot clinic on May 16th um, for the COVID vaccine. So if you are still able to sign up for that, we would love for you to do that. As of Thursday, we had 95 scheduled, and we need 101. So if you haven't signed up, please do so, because we get a $15,000 grant for our community grocery store. And I want to thank John Elma Barnett and Kathy Severns, who have really taken on this project. Um, and I mean, it's just very exciting. So I know it's going to be our, the biggest shot clinic they've held here in Bowling Green. So we're just really excited and really, really happy with that. Um, our middle school and high school youth are invited to join us on this summer's mission trip to Nashville, June 12th through the 18th. Registration is due next Sunday, May 15th, so you can sign up online using the links in the E! News or Youth News, or you can let Daniel know if you have any questions. Um, as we continue to pray for Megan and her family as they're on sabbatical, I just want to remind everyone that if you have any prayer concerns or other questions or anything that you need to know, please contact Daniel and myself. Um, you can text us or call us in the church office or send us an email um, so that Megan can enjoy her time away and get some new perspective and some rest and relaxation. Will you please rise for our benediction? As you go out this week, may God grant you the heart to be hospitable, the courage to share, the openness to listen, and the opportunity to work alongside your neighbors. With God as our foundation, when I know you and you know me, amazing things can happen. Amen. Please stay standing as we sing our doxology. <laughs>